thank you guys very much and thank you for coming. So with that said, I'm gonna just jump into the talk. So the talk we're gonna to do today is yellow means proceed with caution, right? This is about practical de-escalation. So, um, and that's what we call foreshadowing. Um, so practical de-escalation, this is really just gonna cover um, when you're in an interpersonal communication situation, when you're interacting with someone else, there's phases, right? There's different phases of communication. You're not talking to them, you are talking to them, those kind of things. And things can go from good to bad very quickly, and this talk is gonna be about managing and moving through that scale, and preferably a big focus on de-escalating from when that it gets too far to the right on that scale and starts to become a, ineffective communication situation, right? So my name is Noah Badome. Uh, like I said, I'm a penetration tester at NCC. Um, I'm a former Marine, and I love really terrible coffee. So I actually like Starbucks, that's a problem. Um, before I get going, I want to talk about this. Uh, I use this slide in every single presentation I do, because this describes me very closely. In this talk specifically, this means something better, because this doesn't apply, right? So in life, I'm a big fan of the direct approach. But um, in communication, the direct approach will often alienate you, so you're, you're, uh, the person you're talking to in an offensive or defensive manner can really like be counterproductive to effective communication, right? Talking and actually like taking the time to understand what someone else is saying, to communicate, to ask questions, to really be part of the process of getting to know them rather than just pushing to that end goal will cause much more effective communication in the long term. So even though this is really, really cool, this is not for the content that we're going to be talking about. So that's just my little uh, disclaimer there. And my other disclaimer, basically like this stuff, these techniques I'm going to talk about are really effective and I use them a lot and they do really well but you have to practice them, you have to be conscious about when you use them, right? Um, and don't do anything illegal or stupid that's gonna get you hurt, because you can't blame me. All right, so, so about this talk, we're gonna talk about moving through a scale of, uh, of social interaction, right? So whenever I interact with anybody, basically at all, um, any social interaction, I go through a scale, right? The scale starts to green, goes to black. So green, yellow, red, black. And as I'm talking, I'm trying to evaluate where along that scale I'm at and where along that scale I want to be, right? So we're gonna talk about, use that scale as kind of our object of how we move through those communication phases and then how we de-escalate the situation to stay in the optimal phases without spending too much time in the suboptimal phases and so that we can keep this whole conversation thing that we're gonna be interacting with comfortable for both people, right? And I'll talk about that more down the road. So this applies to social engineering, as opposed to just interpersonal communication in general, and I pull a lot from principles used for uh, crisis negotiation and those kind of things, right? So even if you're not an SE, this can be applicable in almost any social situation you could be in where you're communicating with another individual, right? We're gonna talk about, a lot about active listening and those kind of things. So let's get right in. Uh, this is just a caveat. So, it's gonna sound kinda of like Cooper's Colors, but it's not about uh, situational awareness, which Cooper's Colors is a situational awareness color scale. This is about um, the, the status of a social interaction. So even though it's a similar color scale, it's not the same thing. Just didn't wanna uh, offend Mr. Cooper. So overview, right, we're gonna talk about the scale, we're gonna talk about the principles that I use, we're gonna talk about maintaining yellow, which is basically at most times the most optimal phase to be in. We're gonna talk about the red line, which is that definition between moving from yellow to red, and then we're gonna talk about doing damage control or de-escalation when things get a little too hot, right? So the scale, right? So the scale goes from green. This is at the point where you're not interacting with your target in like a meaningful way yet. This could be, this is like, what you're doing when you're trying to tailgate. This is when you're just walking down a hallway, you glance at someone and wave hi, or do those things, right? This is not actively engaged. Yellow is actively engaged. So at this point, we're communicating, we're processing data, we're having a conversation. Red is when a person now is trying to actively disengage, or trying to aggress, into a point where the conversation and communication is no longer effective on both sides. And then black is when we've entered that escalation of force, the person has hung up the phone, the person has left the interaction, run away screaming with their hands in the air, whatever they happen to do, right? So, principles. The most important principle. <laughs> All right, so the green phase, right? Screen phase is not actively engaged, right? This is, you're evading detection. That's what it's most optimal for. We're just moving along, that's when we're tailgating, when we're trying to just do some recon and observe and be unnoticed. So at this point, we're 
basically just part of the background noise, right? We're non-threatening. This is the this is the recon and tailgating and intrusion phase most of the time, or just when we're walking down the hall. So transitioning from green to yellow, right? So when we're transitioning from green to yellow, this is probably one of the most pivotal points, right? This is when you walk up and introduce yourself, when you start your phone call, when you initiate an interaction, right? And how you initiate that interaction is key to where on that scale you start, right? So if I walk up and I'm suddenly just a jerk, we're probably starting pretty close to red. But if I walk up, hi, I'm Noah Badome, and I don't give you any reason to be offended or defensive or afraid or anything like that, we're probably gonna slide right very easily into yellow. Now we're having an interpersonal communication, we're having an interaction, transferring data, we're talking, right? At that point I can do active listening, we can actually have communication, right? And this is also optimal for if you're a social engineer, now we're talking to someone who's not already defensive of you, we can start moving towards a relationship where we can request data, where we can get passwords, where we can get information and recon, we can get them to open the door for us, those kind of things. Right, so we want to be very careful when we initiate transfer from green, from green to yellow, right? So ways we're going to do that, we're going to speak uh, at a natural, a non-aggressive pace, right? We're going to introduce ourselves, we're going to pause naturally, um, and we're going to make sure that we're maintaining some good eye contact, open body posture, uh, level tone, matching their mood a little bit, those kind of things. We'll talk about that a little more too. So yellow phase, right? This is just actively interacting. I put up more than 51% of their attention because you're just the main focus, right? This is we're sitting, having a drink and talking, where I'm calling you on the phone and asking you to do something we're discussing something, right? This is just full-on normal interaction, right? This is where that active listing and all those things should take place. So yellow to red. This is where we're gonna start looking at those signs for things starting to going south. Right, so essentially the things you're gonna be looking at and when what it's gonna be is when people start to become defensive, when people start to become unresponsive, um, overly directive in the conversation, people start to be afraid of a situation or uncomfortable, so they try to take control. Right? When someone's un uncomfortable, they try to assert control over a situation. Start seeing those things, you can know that you're starting to move in a direction that is going to be ineffective communication. Right? The more uncomfortable your target is, the more uncomfortable anyone in a conversation is going to be, the less effective your ability to communicate, get them to hear you, and your ability to hear really what they're trying to say is gonna be, right? Because when people are uncomfortable, we start to say stupid things, <laughs> we start to not be as good at communicating. So it's negative both for the person who's trying to communicate to you, and also for the person who's trying to get that information, those kind of things, right? So a really good uh, sign of this is waning interest, right? When it sounds like they're not very responsive, or when they don't seem totally engaged in what you're doing. Um, on the phone, it could even be that they're Googling something because they want to find out if you're legit so they can hang up on you, whatever it happens to be. Those are those signs that start to say, okay, we need to think about this transition, right? We'll talk about how to counteract that a little later. All right, so the red phase. This is not an optimal phase, right? So yellow and green can be optimal for many different reasons. Red and black are not optimal, right? Uh, I will always argue that it's easier to do things when things are peaceful and relaxed than when things are crazy, right? So. Red phase is not optimal. What it looks like is people are actively trying to disengage. Uh, someone is actively aggressive, angry, frustrated, um, wants to get off the phone, threatening to call the police, those kind of things, right? All right, and so going into black. So black is also not optimal because you're probably getting punched in the face, right? <laughs> so black is active, uh, uh, active engagement in Escalation of force, right, which could include the use of lethal force, which is never good. Uh, this is someone has already hung up the phone, like I said earlier, they run away screaming, whatever they're doing, right? So this is the, this is game over. We never want to get here. All right, so these are, this is just a, a cheat sheet for the outcomes of these phases, right, the ideal outcomes. Green is your unnoticed, yellow is your actively engaging, right? Red is a potential escalation to black, right, and then black is game over, it's over. Um, no more chance for positive interaction. So now we're moving to maintaining yellow. Yellow is probably the most effective phase for getting information, doing all the things you want to do. Uh, it's also, the reason it's yellow and not green is because it's also one of the most dangerous phases because it can lead to escalation to yellow, or to red and black. So the reason, yellow has a very high gain but also has a very high risk because you could say something stupid and then they get mad at you, right? They don't want to talk to you anymore, it could be their password or whatever. So that being said, we just want to make sure that when we're going to yellow, we are proceeding with caution, being aware of the people that we're interacting with, what they're saying, what we're saying to them, right? 
and that we're being very conscious of how we're interacting with them and how we are being the caretaker of their comfort, which I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but that's something I want you to keep in the back of your head. And that's a picture of a guy shaving with mustard. He is staying in the yellow. <laughs> All, right. All right, so the goal, right? This is the, the inevitable goal of any conversation when we're trying to get information, have effective communication, any of those things, is to keep both people calm so we can effectively communicate, right? So we want to make sure everyone feels respected, valid, comfortable, understood, empathized with, those kind of things, right? If you make someone feel valid in a conversation, they're going to be more willing to talk, right? So sometimes this takes longer, right? Because you actually have to think about what you say. You have to be cautious with how you progress through the conversation. So sometimes when I'm doing phone, when I'm doing like SE on the phone, it could take me 30 minutes to get someone's password. Because on some cases, one time I spent an hour and a half troubleshooting someone's iPhone for them to make sure, until they finally gave me their password to make it easier, but I already fixed their iPhone, right? So like, you have to invest time in good, uh, effective communication. You can't rush those things, right? You have to be aware that one of the things you're doing is also taking care of the other person. Even if it's somebody who you're gonna take data from, sometimes it's not that person. Sometimes it's your wife and you're having an argument. Sometimes it's someone at work. Whatever happens to be, you are the caretaker of that person's comfort. All right, so, so techniques for being that caretaker, right? For maintaining that yellow. Okay, we're gonna do things like, we're gonna do language mirroring. So that's a technique where uh, a vocabulary word or something that someone else is using, that you slip that into your own conversation as you're speaking back to them, or also reiterating the things they've said to you by using language that they're familiar with, right? And by doing that, they become more comfortable in that conversational tone. So the next is mood pacing, right? This is like, if someone else is calm, you stay calm. If someone gets a little excited about something because something really cool happened, you should also get excited with them so they feel validated, emphasized with, and there's a rapport, right? So people in general are vain, right? We love mirrors, right? We like, like oh, I want to look good today. Even if like, we look terrible, we will like, figure out the best way to look the best terrible we can today, right? <laughs> so like, people love mirrors, and using that mirror is going to make people more comfortable, right? Reflecting the positive things of somebody back at them in conversation is going to make them more comfortable and more willing to talk while we're discussing is going to make them more willing to listen to you. And that's the big thing is that the more comfortable they are, the more they feel listened to, the more they're going to be willing to listen to you. So empowering, right? This is like, you don't want them to feel like they're just being pushed around in a conversation most of the time. Sure, there's side cases, but most of the time you want to make them feel like they're an active person, active participant in the conversation, and they have some say in direction, even if that same direction is a lie, right? One thing I do a lot is I get people to give me their password by having them change their password, because at least they got to tell me they weren't going to give me their password, right? It's the same thing, but they feel like they're in control of that situation, right? So empowering them, making someone feel valid in a conversation is going to be, again, another technique to get them to listen to you. It's going to keep them calm and also let you get information, data, action, interactions from them, right? So giving versus taking. This is like a big thing I harp on a lot, is giving versus taking is any time where you can volunteer information, any time you can ask questions and give them a chance to be like active in the conversation where you can concede some ground is gonna make them feel more comfortable and make them more willing to trust you, right? So the golden rule, this is not that golden rule. This is the, uh, it's the long con is usually better, right? So it's usually better to disengage from a conversation without ever getting information, without stress, other, rather than stress somebody out. Because if I can disengage from you on a good note, I can probably come back later to gather some other side information and then use that initial rapport of conversation to build at maybe another target or a side goal or something else I'm doing, right? Rather than burn a conversation or burn a relationship, it's better to just exit gracefully. Okay, so now we've talked about the phases, we've talked about kind of that meaningful communication, we've talked about uh, keeping those communication channels open so you can request data and so that we can keep them comfortable, right? So now we're gonna talk about when, when things start to go bad. When things go sideways, we're gonna start to try to back things off to a usable situation, right? And that, I'm calling that the red line. So first, red interactions. So red interactions, your target becomes, starts to become uncooperative, right? They might be unresponsive, they might get aggressive, upset, uncomfortable, frustrated, whatever it happens to be, it's not conducive to effective communication, right? Any couple can tell you that when you start talking and one of you starts getting pissed off, the conversation probably doesn't go very well, right? So it's good to take a step back at that point and then let things calm down and then rediscuss. 
right? So these are all signs that we're getting into a non-effective communication state, and now we want to back ourselves off into an effective communication state. We want to do it preferably without disengaging. So how we're going to do that, right? Responding to red. So we're going to identify sources of aggravation. We're going to not verbally, but we're going to mentally identify the situations and think, okay, what did I do? What situation caused this escalation into this negative, non-effective communication space, right? Then we want to start validating their frustration, being upset, their um, concern with those issues we identify, right? Want to express to them, oh, I understand you're upset. Here's this thing, right? Start making them feel valid and start opening that channel of discussion for what upset them in the first place, right? So men fences, that's that. We want to back slowly away, apologize, offer concession, right? We want to start making them feel like we obviously heard them and we're willing to start mending that issue that we caused, right? So we want to start constructing a solution, but we want to do it with them. So at this point, if we get to the point where they're now listening to us again, which we'll talk about how we're going to get them to that point, we want to start working with them to figure out what the best solution is, right? So this is a really good uh, opportunity for SE because then you can start getting them to volunteer information to make the situation better, right? Well, what would you have me do? Oh, well, let's use this web portal that you didn't know existed, or let's do this thing that we you know, weren't aware that we could do, right? So at this point, this is a chance where we're going to start involving them actively in the, the fixing of the situation, which makes them feel more validated, and then is going to give us an opportunity to continue de-escalating that situation, right? So again, like I keep harping on, we are the caretaker of their comfort, right? We're responsible for keeping them comfortable in that conversation. Some more techniques, right? So be a negotiator. Uh, so the longer you can keep a conversation going, redirect their aggression towards something else, um, Keep them, you know, at a calm tone. Like, you can change their the the discussion subject slightly. So we're talking about something they're not as mad about. The longer they maintain that calm tone, the conversation goes. The more likely they are to naturally settle, right? As long as we can keep them away from those things that were aggravating them, or we can counteract those things with solutions and concessions. So we're going to emphasize um, our relationship, right? Like. We want to make sure we draw them back to the positive aspects of the relationship we're interacting with them. One example is when we're doing, we're posing as, let's say, a help desk person. Well, I really want to just help you get the best out of your connectivity as possible. I really want to just help you fix this issue with your computer. I'm sorry I frustrated you. Can we work towards that together, right? These kind of things, reminding them of the positive gains of our relationship, because people are also greedy, right, is going to be something that's going to give us a lot of tools to work with, with de-escalating, right? And so all those things go into fostering a rapport, right? Building this connection back with the individual. So uh, empowering is kind of advanced at this point because when we empower somebody, we can also give them the option to just say no and hang up the phone, which is good because sometimes we can give them that option knowing they're not going to take it, but it makes them feel empowered. But you have to be aware that if you give someone an option where one of those options is uh, less beneficial, there's always a chance they're going to take it. All right. So. This is the, this slide is a little misnamed, but this is kind of the way to get back to those interactions, right? To go from the, when we're near that dark red and black, back to that yellow, right? And so this is based on the behavioral change stairway, which is a model used by crisis negotiators, um, psychologists, and lots of other people doing, you know, very intense inter uh, connectivity, interpersonal communication work, right? So what this essentially is, is that active listening, right? Lots of studies have showed so far that active listening is the, one of the strongest tools you have in communicating with another person, right? People, when people feel like they're listened to, they're more willing to communicate, right? And so by doing that, by being an active listener, you validate that person and get them to be more willing to discuss things with you, give you data, to progress in a positive way through that relationship, right? Uh, they recently did a study, I can't put exactly where it's from, but recently did a study where they had two groups of people. One group of people just asked questions and the other group of people conversed normally. And when they were asked who were the better listeners, it was the people who only asked questions, right? So that's that active listening, right? Like really engaging and committing to making sure someone else feels heard. So next is empathy, right? So now once we're engaging in active, uh, in active listening, we want to make sure that our target understands that we know how they feel, that we are processing the data that they're giving to us, and that we feel something towards that, right? So that's when someone tells you something, say, okay, well, what I'm hearing from you is that this is a situation, right? We want to kind of avoid emotional labeling, saying, well, it sounds like you're mad, 
unless they specifically use that label to describe their emotions, and then you're free to use it, right? So at this point with empathy, we're gonna express to them that we understand how they're feeling, and here are some things that we think about that, give them some active feedback on that information, to ask them more questions to really get at the root of the issues, and we can start constructing those um, the solutions we talked about, right? So once we have empathy, we have rapport. So empathy is that you're feeling what they're feeling, and rapport is that they understand and feel that you're feeling what they're feeling, right? So you can think of it as a two-way street, right? Empathy is your lane, and rapport is their lane. Once they feel like you're emphasizing with them, they are more likely to open up a level for rapport. At that point, you can start exerting influence. Once you start exerting influence, you can start requesting actions, right? So they're upset, we start talking, we're actively listening, we're discussing how they're feeling about the situation, we're redirecting them towards less frustrating things, and as that happens, uh, we start to express our empathy that builds our rapport, say, well, let's go ahead and do this thing now that will fix this issue. They're more willing to do that because they feel validated and connected to and, and feel like we actually give a crap about what is going on in this interpersonal communication. Right, so two things to be aware of while we're doing that is the OODA loop and then awareness of uh, physical cues, right? So OODA loop is observe, orient, uh, decide, and act. Okay, so the OODA loop is a, a technique that fighter pilots use to control their response times to um, dogfights and those kind of things, and also that martial artists and stuff use to control their response times in a combat situation, right? Well, we can apply it here. So the OODA loop is observe, so see the information, the situations around you, orient, which is figure out how you fit into that situation. Are you the aggressor? Are you the good guy? Where are you in relation to that emotional conversation? Decide on a course of action, even if that course of action is to not act at all, and then deliberately take that action, observe the new situation that you've caused, orient yourself to the new situation, decide on another course, etc. And the faster and more and smoother you can get at doing those, that OODA loop cycle, as you're going through that emotional interaction, you will be better at navigating their own emotional responses and directing them towards something that is effective communication. They start to calm down and we move back to yellow and now we can have our conversation again. The physical cues is just be aware of how you're presenting yourself and how they're presenting themselves. If they're crossing their, hand, their arms, if they're doing closed body language, open body language, aggressive, submissive, just be aware of those things and also how you're communicating because you know, a lot of communication is nonverbal. So, examples, right? Um, I don't have a lot of concrete examples I can actually share, but I, I like to talk a little bit about like interpersonal communication with social engineering, specifically like phone calling, right? So when you're doing a social engineering phone call, I'll just go through like a typical phone call I've had. So I call the person, they answer the phone, and I introduce myself. So maybe I've got a little too much caffeine in my system, maybe I'm a little stressed out with work, whatever, and I introduce myself and roll right into my pretext without giving a natural pause or them a chance to talk. They immediately, almost nine times out of ten, become defensive and that call usually doesn't go very well, right? because they feel aggressed on initially, and I set that initial placement in the scale much closer to red, right? Now, when I start that call and I give a nice pause, introduce myself, ask how their day's going, say, okay, and then roll naturally into, like when they ask, the, um, well, how can I help you? We roll naturally into our pretext, and then we start to progress through that interaction, right? Taking time to discuss things that come up in a natural, calm way, right? Where we're not really like harping on this one specific goal we're trying to get to. We're eventually going to get those credentials, eventually going to get that information, eventually get them to get the interaction, but they eventually is the key. We have to be willing to go on that, that um, interaction with them in a way that they feel like they are equally part of the communication, right? So, I'm not going to go through every one of these things, but I just want to like focus on the negotiator's stance, right? So, when the situation starts to go bad, you need to take a step back and think, okay, so this person is upset. Why are they upset? And how am I going to address the issues that they're upset about and move them back to yellow so then I can then start requesting information, those things again, right? And so we're gonna to go to that behavioral change stairway. We're gonna actively listen. We're gonna establish that empathy. We're gonna get that rapport going and then we're going to start backing them down towards positive interactions, even if there are little things, right? It's important to remember that little wins lead to big wins, right? So if we can get them to do one little concession, that opens the door for potentially more trust on their side, and also more rapport, and then the ability to exert more influence. 
All right, and so these are just some references for stuff that I've talked about, and they'll be available with the slides. Um, so a big part of this is questions. So I wanted to leave a lot of time. So that was the 30 minute version of the talk. I want to leave a lot of time for questions because a lot of these things are things that apply specifically to specific situations. And a lot of people are going to have some side questions and stuff about those things. So I wanted to make sure I opened a lot of time for that. So any questions, happy to answer. Yeah, what's going on? So uh, you talked a lot about uh, estimation. Sure. So actually, those same techniques, right? First, we're going to actively. So his question was, how do we address suspicion? I, I use the word aggression and aggressive a lot, um, but I was, I was using that kind of as a catch-all. So his question was, how do we address uh, escalations into red via suspicion? Right? They openly are accusing us of being a liar. Those kind of things, right? So we're going to use that same behavioral staircase. Uh, approach, right? We're going to actively listen and we're going to acknowledge the fact that they think we're full of crap, which we probably are, right? So we're going to say, yeah, I understand this sounds fishy and here, here are some reasons why and here's why I'm sure that you're good. I'm glad that you um, identified these things, but this is what's going on, right? So we're going to actively listen. We're going to emphasize with how they're feeling about being suspicious. Then from there, we're going to try to build that rapport by giving those reasonings. And then from there, we're going to try to influence them back in a positive way, right? If we can't, if they feel super uncomfortable about it, we're going to say, you know what, if you feel really uncomfortable with the situation, I understand. I'm pressed for time too. Why don't we go ahead and disconnect and I'll have my supervisor send you an email, right? Because at least then you're maintaining a positive tone and giving them at least a time window where they're not going to escalate, right? Did that answer your question? Yes, please. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Furthest I've gotten into the red. Um, so, me personally, uh, are you talking about? So, okay, the furthest I've gotten into the red was not definitely not in normal social engineering. But I mean, I've been in situations like, you know, at a bar, and then someone pulls a knife and wants to do something crazy and is threatening to, you know, wants to go outside and all these things, right? And I've been able to talk those situations down before, usually by offering alcohol, right? That's a good way. I understand you're mad. I didn't mean it like that, man. Can we have a beer? Right? This works often. <laughs> right? Because they're like, uh, stab you, go to prison, drink free alcohol. I'll go with option number two. Right? So that's that whole, hey, I hear what you're saying. Here's a better situation. Build some rapport. The alcohol offer kind of builds the rapport and empathy all the way to influence, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, in social engineering, I've been in a situation where I've been tailgating in and then like a security guard, an armed security guard has caught me and, you know, in their defensive position has put their hand on their weapon while they're talking, right? And that's obviously a little aggravating, right? Because you see that and then think all they have to do is be having a bad day and I'm having a worse day, right? So those kind of situations, it's very comfortable, it's very important to think about that scale and say, okay, I have to keep this person as l calm as possible for as long as possible. The longer someone is calm and non-aggressive, a lot of studies have shown that it's more likely they're not going to be aggressive or do something in the in, at the end result, right? So the longer you keep them calm, keep them talking, you know, concede to their, especially if someone has a weapon and they actually do something, you probably just do it, right? Um, and those are also the cases where you might start to look at pulling a get out of jail free letter if you don't think you can come back from it, or if you have any fear for yourself, always, you know, go to that position of safety, right? Because no pen test is worth getting shot over, right? But um, I, I've been able to talk those down, and it's all using that behavioral staircase model, right? Active listening is the greatest key, and comfort is the most integral component to getting someone to listen to you. So, oh, so um, it's important to understand the like the cultural paradigm around that, right? So, like in America, our cultural paradigm is like a lot of people want like to. Oh, sorry, sorry. He was talking about physical proximity, right? His question was about physical proximity and touching during these communications to keep them effective. So, um, and my my response here is that we have to be aware of the cultural paradigm, right? Some people are going to be more comfortable closer, depending on culture, depending on um, you know that individual's upbringing, all those kind of things. And if you're okay with that comfort, you can be standing closer, those kind of things. But in my personal experience, it's better to keep about two body lengths or more, or two body widths or more from that person and give them their space. And if they start to you know retract, do not advance, right? If they start to move towards you, though, that's usually a good sign, right? Because usually proximity is directly related to comfort. Is your question? Yes, sir. What if you're like just in a hard stalemate? 
where if you, they want something from you and you don't want to give it to you, you can give it to them because you feel like giving it up compromises your goal. And what's your response? Sure. So the question is, we're in a hard stalemate, and the the person we're talking to wants us to make a concession that we feel would be detrimental to our end goal, right? How do we respond to that situation? So there's kind of two things here. So the first is weighing the actual value of that concession uh, as opposed to potential side avenues that would still lead to your goal anyway. And if that, in that weighing you see that you can still kind of get to where you go, where you need to go in a roundabout manner, it's better to just make that concession and put in the extra work to go around that side channel. Um, if it's something that would be you know, physically detrimental to you, if it's something that would be that you're just very uncomfortable with doing, especially if it's not an SC situation, if it's in a communication situation, um, it's usually better to temporarily disengage and say, okay, well, let's not aggress on this anymore. Let's, let's take a step back, think about things, and, and reconvene, right? Especially in normal, like, interpersonal communication. Um, but in the end, it's usually better to exit gracefully than to try to push a situation. Sometimes you're just not going to win, but there's usually somebody else who's going to give you that information. And in situations of life where it's somebody you're interacting with who you have to share space with over a long time, it's better to work together to find a compromise on both sides, even if that takes a lot of extra time to do so. So if you try to stall on Well, I, I mean, it, it really depends on exactly the stalemate we're talking about, right? Like, if we're talking about where they want us to, like, let's say we have our wallet, and they're like, we want you to give us you know, all your bank money, we're, sometimes we're just not going to make the concession, but we want to exit gracefully and say things like, okay, well, I can't concede that right now, but let me take a step back, you know, and then if it's like a SE situation, say, I'm going to step back and have my manager give you an email, you know, address a different way to do this, but it's better to gracefully exit if that concession is just something you can't make. Cool. Also, stalling, you did mention that stalling is something sometimes, you stall long enough, sometimes they just didn't want it bad enough, right? And they'll give in. Yes, sir. What about that framework of active listening to active listening? How does the content of social question like that? Such that, hey, here's what your peers are doing, and they didn't do this, and that, that is the way that your question is going to be So, uh, So the question was, how does peer pressure play into the behavioral change stairway, right? So um, peer pressure, especially when, like, when, I'm, when you're actively like, referencing peer pressure to influence an action, I find that to be really ineffective. So um, people value their individual, individuality, right? Like psychology shows that a lot of people value their individuality but don't want to be called out, right? So by calling someone out and also get it, trying to force them to follow someone else even though they would normally do that in that case, it kind of puts them on that back foot defensive. Now, if, you, if you're communicating with someone who you know is directly susceptible to that, and you can do it in a way that is uh, subtle, not just like, hey, everyone else is doing it, you should do it, but like, well, you know, I've already gotten other people hooked up on this very positive thing, would you like to be involved in this thing? That kind of thing can be really effective, but for the most part, just straight up calling peer pressure tends to uh, be counterproductive. Yes. So, the interaction we talk about group placing and uh, language barrier, can you give some examples of giving and taking? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so, giving, right? Like volunteering information of yourself, um, uh, making concessions, right? And they're asking you to do things that might take extra time, might take ex may, a little extra stress on you. Being willing and open and volunteering that information that you're willing to do those things. Even well, a lot of times, they won't even have you actually do them. They will just feel more comfortable the fact that you are willing to put yourself out there and be uh, exposed in a way that makes them feel like they're an equal partner and not just doing things that you're asking them to do in that conversation. Can I answer your question? Sure. I'm just trying to avoid like the time me and my wife get a bite. No, <laughs> like, um, so I, I guess a really good one is like. Um, I get on the phone with an individual and I'm trying to request information and they say, well, um, you know, I don't even know who you are or any of those kind of things. And instead of like, say, getting off the phone and sending an email, which is a good way to validate, you can start really valid uh, validating yourself by demonstrating like your willingness to discuss these things about yourself. Like, uh, this is who I am, this is where I work, this is what I do, those things. And being open and providing that communication will give them, usually prompt them to provide information back to you, right? Or you can say something like, hey, I need this information. If you need an example of this information, here's mine. This is what it would look like. It'll be on this. Like on my piece of paper, it reads this, right? And at that point, they're like, okay, someone is willing to share and expose themselves. Even if that information is total BS, it still means something to them, right? 
Yeah. Any question? Yes, sir. Just to the last point that you said, the last talk that we had here, and on the he said, here it corporate we do this, what do you do there? Here it corporate we do this, what do you do there? Sure. It's BS information, right? But the guy on the other side feels that he's reciprocating, not just providing. Yeah. Absolutely. So his point was that apparently in an earlier talk, uh, an individual used that, uh, that principle in saying, hey, at corporate, we do this. What do you guys do there? At corporate, we do this. What do you guys do there? That was effective to gather the information. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, sir. So uh, the question is, if you want to do a physical, physically approach somebody and they're alone in a room, right? Um, or they're in a room, period, right? So first thing is to remember that people, you know, in general, right, we're all very protective of our space for the most part. Like, oh, a group. I thought you said a room, sorry. Uh, in, in a group, right? So uh, usually, yeah, it's better, in my opinion, to wait until they're in a, a, I guess, a comfortable way of being alone, right? Not that they're, let's say, at the urinal or something, right? But like, <laughs> like if, they're getting, if, you, if they're sitting in the lunchroom talking, and they're drinking a cup of coffee and everyone leaves, you now have your cup of coffee, that's a good time to say, hey, can I sit here? Sit down and then start discussing, right? One of my favorite things to do on physicals is take a lunch when I, or a breakfast when I go in in the morning like a banana and something, go grab one of their coffee mugs in the lunchroom, pour myself a cup of coffee and sit down and eat a banana, talk to the people at the lunch table. Because later on when I ask someone for network access or something, oh yeah, that's the guy I ate lunch with, right? But I try to... Uh, start my interactions with people while they're separated because I can build an interpersonal communication and relationship with them. And then when other people start adding to the mix, that person will act as my gateway to that interaction. They're like, oh, have you met Noah? He's the new this guy. He's really great. Let's all have a conversation. And at that point, then we can start talking, right? It's easier to integrate yourself into a group by starting usually with one individual, except in my opinion, like large situations like this, where we have like a large conference or concert, or a social gathering of some sort, it's good to like slip up into the group and then be able to volunteer information and also call yourself out for being the guy who just, just jumped into the group. Like, oh, hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just heard this and this and this. Oh, yeah, and then you get pulled into that conversational flow and eventually when they start asking you questions, you know you're at that point where you can start really asking them questions and building that active listening and that rapport. Answer your question? Yeah. Uh, can you actually answer the question you asked? Oh, <laughs> about the room? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, you get into this a lot with like, uh, while you're in like doing physicals and there's like, you're moving through the building and you need to get additional access, let's say to a secured area or something like that, or you, you don't know where something is. And sometimes the best, the easiest way is just ask. Um, so when you see someone in a room, the, the first thing is you gotta remember they're very protective of their space. People are very like, this is my space, especially let's say their office, right? So the first thing is if the door's shut, you should probably just not, you should probably leave it alone. Wait till the door's open or until that person comes out of that space. The second thing is that once the door's open, you wanna make sure you request permission before you ask. Hey, um, I'm sorry to bother you, but you do, have, do you have a minute? And usually their response will be something like, oh yeah, yeah, come right in. And then once they've invited you to your space, there's already a level of rapport that has been built because there's a level of comfort they have by being in their own personal space. And that office is theirs, right? Or that, that room is theirs, or that, that space that they're currently in control of is theirs, right? And at that point, then you can start addressing. Now, if there's people in that room, you probably want to avoid that too because they're probably locked into a specific social interaction and that's not really going to be a good channel for injecting yourself or building that rapport and those kind of things. And it can go really fast to red because you go in there and then suddenly like someone else who is very suspicious starts asking questions and then it just all goes crap. Questions? Yes, sir. Sure. How do I get them, how do I get the, the text, so the question was, if I'm trying to get a tech, inside tech support number from somebody who doesn't actually have the number, is that the question? Oh, okay. So, I, so I'm having a little tar trouble hearing you, but it sounds like the, the question is, how do we get inside numbers when we only have the tech support number, right, without getting to the red? Because tech support tends to be, you know, uh, one, they're very dedicated to process because process is how they deal with less BS through their day. And as tech support, they are going to deal with a whole metric load of BS, right? 
Uh, second is that they're, one of their jobs is to be suspicious of situations and that's why they enforce process, right? So when we initiate the communication, the first thing we have to be aware of are the things that are gonna be valuable to them, right? In any communication, if you already know the values that someone might hold dear, you need to be aware of those things going in and making sure that we don't just step on them from the get-go, right? So once being aware that they're probably suspicious, security-oriented, process-oriented, we're gonna get on that phone and then we're gonna say, we're gonna start trying to inject ourselves into, hey, um, a non-threatening situation that could redirect us to someone else who would probably be more willing to provide us that information. Right? So in many cases, they'll be like, hi, this is so-and-so from this, which with information that we've enumerated from, say, LinkedIn, you know, Facebook, open source information gathering, right? Uh, I'm on site somewhere. I have a couple questions. I haven't been able to connect to, uh, I have, my phone's dead or whatever. I haven't been able to connect to some stuff, and I need to get some information. Can you tell me who I need to call to get that information, right? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, sure. You need to call this person. Well, can you give me their direct line? Oh, well, this, okay. And then a lot of time you can just call the operator, honestly, like if you really need a phone number. And then also there's a really terrible trend in, um, in current stuff where like you can just hit a button and get the list of everyone in that name. And then, you know, so you can just go through those as far as the uh, directories, right? But I would say just avoid directly saying, hey, give me this phone number, but give a good pretext, a good reasoning why, right? And be willing to be like, or could you direct me to someone who could help me better, right? And if they ask for information that you don't have, um, other than being, being really prepared to say, well, um, I'm not comfortable with providing that information on the phone right now because I'm not in a secure place, but I'll call you back later and then gracefully disengage. Any question? More questions? Yes, sir. What's the most dangerous red to black situation that you've ever been in in a physical environment that has to be? Part of, as part of social engineering, or, okay. So, because I did Iraq and Afghanistan, so that's something entirely different. <laughs> uh, so, um, as far as social engineering goes, I think the most, so it didn't really go to black, but the potential to go to black was very high, right? So, um, I was in a situation where they, they staffed their night security guards, and I did not know this going in, entirely with off-duty police officers. <laughs> There's another one too where I was doing a one in a very uh, crime embroiled city where this place also had uh, their own police department. Like they a contingent of police that just hung out in the building, right? So in both of these situations, I'm interacting with a police officer. Now police officers, just like military or anyone else, they have a specific sense of training and escalation force and those kind of things. But something to be aware of, and this varies depending on um, the branch or the, or the police department, et cetera, is the amount of training they actually participate in, right? Because the more you train, the more comfortable you are in that situation you train for. But the less you train, the more information you have about how to interact, but less comfortable you are, which will lead to negative decisions, right? So a lot of time you have junior police officers who use escalation of force unnecessarily or whatever because they were just scared and nervous and hadn't had enough training yet, right? A lot of time a veteran police officer will be in a situation where it gets really, really crazy and they don't go to escalation of force because they know how to handle that situation and step it down and it ends up being better for everybody in the long run, right? So in this situation I go into the building and I immediately identify that he's got you know, a police issue firearm on his hip and his like badge and lunch is pegged, pegged to his lunch bag and is sitting on the counter and he's eating a sandwich at like 10 o'clock at night and I'm trying to pose as somebody going in to get something, right? So at this point it's all bad, right? Because <laughs> he's looking at me, he doesn't know me, usually no one shows up, right? Um, I was eventually able, based on uh, information gathering and stuff, to avoid escalating at all. I had done all my research. I approached him very cautiously. I would make sure to keep my hands visible, to be calm, to not be threatening in any way, and be very respectful, right? Um, especially like older males, um, like older male military-oriented people are, love sir, yes, no, respectful interactions. And those tend to put them in a very positive place. So knowing you know, the social, some of those stereotypes right, can be very effective to use. So you go use those to initiate that initial conversation and keep it calm. And I was able to talk him into opening the door and getting me upstairs because I forgot my badge or whatever, right? But um, it was potentially really bad, right? Because if I came in and then upset him, I could be on the ground. You know, he probably isn't going to let me pull my jail, get out of jail free letter, right? So, um, and the, the, I, think, I think that was probably the worst as far as like, um, like actively risk. Now there was an unarmed security guard who confronted me. Um, I had produced, created some documentation and he wanted to take it from me. But I knew if he took it from me, 
to validate who I was, it was gonna blow my cover because on, it looked good superficially, but on inspection, it was not gonna hold up on deep analysis. Um, and so I needed to avoid him being wanting to take that, that credential, right? And so doing so, I needed to keep him talking for long enough to build enough rapport and trust with him that he you know, said, okay, well, I think you're good, doesn't matter, right? And redirect enough from that initial target of that credential to something else that I could give him or was willing to give him like my driver's license, because I really don't care if he has my driver's license, because this is part of a project, I'm going to get it back, right? Uh, any other questions? Yep. How important is the community of the reasons that you give? For example, I remember there was a study about people trying to do a social engineering experiment. Let's keep in mind, how do you the most superficial reasons, like, can I skip ahead because I need to be college? That was, that was it, that was the whole reason. Sure. And have you found that to be true, that just the, just having a reason of, can I do this because of, and the reason, how important is the validity of the reason that you give? Sure. So uh, her question was, how important is the validity of the reasoning that I give, you know, for whatever reason in a social interaction? And uh, the answer to that is, it varies a lot, right? A lot of the time, getting to the front of the line is as easy as giving some BS excuse of, oh, well, I really have to pee, or you know, whatever it happens to be, right? Um, one that, like, one of the reasons that is like completely un. Um, uh, verifiable, but like really not that important to other people, but they build that sympathy and empathy is like, uh, you know, my, my pregnant wife is waiting out in the car and I need to get her to her doctor appointment, but I have to get this done, right? They'll be like, oh, you know, prevention of life and limb, uncomfortable person who naturally I'm going to have sympathy for. Sure, you're a nice, caring person. I'm going to let you do the front of the line or, or whatever, right? But it's really important to know your audience, right? We, when we start to have a conversation, there's a lot of questions you can ask, a lot of interactions you can do to really get a feel of who they are, right? If they're a sympathetic person, you know, or if they're just a, a really, like, a logical, uh, procedural person, and that helps you craft those, uh, the depth of excuse you need, right? And then just have a lot of them prepared, <laughs> right? What's going on? So you say um, you practice a lot, though. Coffee shops and bars. So uh, the answer was practice a lot. Well, how do you practice in your free time? Obviously, in like a you know situation, you're not going to get shot, right? Um, and so coffee shops and bars. So what I tell beginning social engineers um, or people who just don't aren't very good at social interaction, period, is go to a coffee shop with a notepad and go sit down and just watch the interactions and write down your thoughts about those interactions. The next time you come, make a goal like. I'm going to have a conversation about one topic with one person, right? And then write out how you're gonna do it and then go and make that approach. You're probably gonna fail the first couple times. Once you get that, maintain that conversation and usually the goal is like a time amount, like we're gonna have a conversation about the weather for two minutes or whatever, right? Then we step back and say, okay, and my next goal is gonna be how do I go up and get a piece of information, something like their, um, shoe size or you know something slightly personal but not something that anyone would be crazy like should probably go up and ask people for their address right because that's going to be a little like uh no right <laughs> so but little things like that or the, their usual coffee order or those kind of things or what their favorite alcohol is and then as you get used to requesting those pieces of information you start to get used to conversation in general and that helps you build that uh, comfort if you're comfortable you start being willing to take a little more risks um, and being less afraid of you know a negative or awkward outcome and that being unafraid of some of those risks and understanding the impacts is something that makes it makes communication really easy because if I'm not scared of you getting mad at me or not scared of you exiting the conversation it's less likely for me to be you know look uh, stressed or uncomfortable while we're having a conversation right so just lots of Lots of conversation, and you know, DEF CON's great for it, right? Go find someone else, sit down, buy them a beer, and talk, and you will get lots of social engineering <laughs> uh, uh, experience. Sure, yeah, that's another thing is defending, right? <laughs> like, don't give stuff up. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned earlier, like, your scale, um, it talks a lot, like, in psychology, you talk about press and release, and like, the glory of the Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, um, 
in reference to like psychological principles, psychological principles of like press and release, do I think of this scale in that terms? And yes, right? That's why I, I focused on yellow. Right? Yellow, yellow is perceived with caution, because yellow has the greatest risk, has the most chance to get you in trouble, caught or shot, but it has the greatest potential for, um, for return. And because of that, um, you can really like work with how to push that red line, and that's why I called it the red line, get the right to that point where you're getting the most information, you're generating the most risk, but you have the most control of that emotional interaction. And as it starts to get bad, having mastery of those principles, you can start to back it off, back it off, and then start requesting information and find out where that threshold is and find that sweet spot where you can just sit and gather a specific type or levels of information for as long as possible for that graceful exit. Answer your question? More? I think we have, have like two more. Uh, one, one question is, it might be a good <laughs> Sure, yeah, go ahead, man. I'm an open book. Uh, does having that knowledge make you happy? Can you stop yourself? Stop when you think you get any of Uh No, so I have the, I, I live on the principle of you wake up dead every morning. So um, I, I basically, my, my approach on life is that uh, your identity is already stolen. You're going to die at 12 this afternoon. And um, your house is burned down while you're gone. Right? So accepting that already, like, you just, you know, you can just kind of live without that much fear, right? So the simple fact is someone is going to get information from you one way or another, right? There are databases that people can get licenses to get access to, and they can just look up your social, right? So the fact is, is, like, you can assume that lots of that data is already known. Now, Am I like protective of specific data and choose not to volunteer? Absolutely. Am I afraid that they're gonna gather it for me or I might slip? Uh, everyone's gonna do something stupid sometime. I, I personally feel the best you can do is plan very well for contingencies and have lots of things backed up, right? Have, you know, for instance, like with the house right here, have money and savings and have insurance. You'll be okay, right? Um, bank with someone who has very good fraud prevention and fraud insurance, right? These kind of things, same with conversation, right? Don't go up and start a conversation with someone if you feel that you are grossly outmatched or you feel that you aren't comfortable at that time or you're very stressed out or you're having a bad day um, unless you just need to talk because you, you probably are more prone to make mistakes. Yes? Sure, so the answer actually is very little. So the answer to that, the question was, you know, most people aren't professional BSers, what kind of amount of information do you get, give to someone to get them to be comfortable talking to you, right? And so the question, answer really is to ask questions, right? You volunteer a little bit of data by yourself, high mind, whatever, as in that initial conversation, that initial kind of honeymoon phase of interaction, you ask a lot of questions, right? You make them feel very much like the, question, the conversation is focused on them, you don't push like into deep questions, but we ask things like, oh, well, how did you feel about that? Oh, well, I thought that was this. So what did you think about this thing? You know, as we go back and forth, and the more questions you ask, the more comfortable they're gonna become in that conversation. You see their body language relax, as their, their eye contact becomes a little softer. And at that point, you can start really asking the harder questions or kind of steering that conversation in the direction you want. Was that answered question? I couldn't hear you very well when you asked. Well, more so, Sure. Yours, but all of that is hard to keep track of. Oh no, I, I usually use, so the question was like fake data that you provide. I usually use real data for the most part because unless you're, so one, if you're a criminal, you can get someone else's data and provide that and make sure you keep really good notes. And the, the other thing is otherwise, like in a social engineering situation where I've been hired by a company, um, unless I'm specifically afraid that they're gonna research me, right? I will use actual information because it's something I can validate, it's something I can prove, right? Like, hi, my name's Noah Badome, and like a lot of times I'll say, I'm, this is Noah from the help desk, unless I've specifically identified, uh, or felt like I needed to specifically identify people at the help desk, you know, like LinkedIn or something like that, then I'll use their information, but I'll also do the research, find their date of birth, their home address, and all those things as much as possible, make a very good dossier, and then keep that, and maintain that the whole time, and make that my character, the entirety, unless I have to switch for some reason, like my cover got burned or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sure. So, so like anything, there's always a way to do something really well and do something really bad, and then after I answer this, we'll be done. Oh, I'm done now. So, okay, let's finish the question. Yes. All right. Um, so, people who just bombard someone with questions and just do everything you do, those people look like complete charlatan, charlatans, right? But it's anything with a measure of um, of discretion can be effective, right? Don't ask a billion questions. That's one or two questions that would elicit a lot of talking from the person you're talking to. Then as that person talks a lot, that distance between questions becomes less suspicious, right? Pick one or two pieces of language that are natural and could be, you know, use, you could be using anyway and just fit them in later in the conversation naturally, right? The, the goal is always being natural, to be as calm as possible. As close as you can say to the truth, the more comfortable you'll be. Hey, thank you very much for everybody's time. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much.